So I am going to, to open with a reading from Howard Thurman. Howard Thurman, for those who don't know, um, I, though I do quote him quite often, um, he was something of a muse for um, Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, King carried one of his books with him everywhere he went. Not the one that I'm about to, to read from, but I just found this so um, appropriate for the moment in which we live. This moment seems like it's never been, and in our lives, it's especially unusual, but it comes alongside any other moments we've had in life where we did not have uh, control or access. Um, so this was written long before um, there was any, there were any lockdowns or, you know, social distancing and uh, staying in your place, all of those kinds of things. So let me just share this. It is ever a grace and a benediction to be able to come to a halt, to stop, to pause, to make a rest of motion. Thus we are privileged to turn aside from the things that occupy and preoccupy our minds in the daily round, to take a long intimate look at ourselves both in retrospect and prospect. The fever of our spirits regarded so necessary to keep us going, to make for the precise and ready functioning of our lives, can settle itself into a perv pervasive calm while we watch the tension drain away. Ah, this is very good. It is at such times that we are free to remember. From within the quiet of our spirits, we may see the startling clarity, see with startling clarity the meaning of past experiences separated in time, but one in quality. Since the undercurrents of our lives and the distant shores toward which their movement points, and hear the inner accent of the words spoken in haste or anger and know the quality of the hurt it gave and feel the depths of our hunger for the wisdom that transcends all our knowledge and our understanding but is always obscured by the blinding tyranny of our activity. So, um, and now we're going to have a, a, a song by... Um, David Moore leading. And if you know it, you're welcome to join in. You can, you're welcome to, you know, to. <laughs> Do we know where it's coming from? Okay, so. It's not mandatory that you're muted because you may want to join in.
screen. Mm -hmm. Judith is sharing her screen. Judith? <laughs> How's that? Better. Okay. Thank you. So um, we've been having some, uh, a little bit of uh, bandwidth um, trouble. And so videos have not been working so well, but I wanted to show the trailer for Dr. Hawkins uh, movie. Um, and so let's give it a shot. And after that, I mean, if it works, good. And uh, after that, um, we'll, Matt's going to make a few announcements, and Jacob has a reading for us. And then we will move right ahead. Okay, hold on one sec. I'm not screen sharing. All right. Hold on. There's Jacob. Hey, yo, hey, yo. <laughs> hey, Jacob. Okay. Sorry. Hello, that's not it. My bad. Oh, that's all right. You, you know what? Let's just go ahead with Matt. Are you sure? Yeah. I think yeah. I've, okay. It's fine. I was iffy on that anyway. All right. Can we see Matt? Do you want me to stop sharing? Yeah. Just put the announcements on the screen, if you, and then I'll just go through that. Well, I don't know where my share screen goes all the time. Well. When you did it before, Ruth, it was working. I just had to adjust to my screen and like pinch out a little bit to see it. Okay. Um, but it was, I mean, I was able to see what you put up. Okay, hold on. Okay. There we go. Let's back it up. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. Back, back, back it up. Um, good to go? Good to go. All right. A little laugh for the morning. Uh, good to see everybody. We have 22 people in counting on this uh, Zoom call today. So that's a, that's a good church day, you know? Uh, that's a good Sunday. And it's sunny and spring is coming. The, uh, well, I guess we had the March showers and the April's bringing flowers. Um, so uh, yeah, it's March 29th, and we're hearing from a wonderful Dr. Larisha Hawkins today. Um, so that'll be a good time. And let's see, we have coming up this week, we have our usual Thursday, um, Thursday Zoom call at 7 p.m., where we're just spending some time together for an hour, hour and a half or so, and uh, really just being with one another in this time. It's good to find what is, uh, what is hopeful around and what is giving us insight and what is grounding us. Um, so it's been a good time for that. Um, we have an email list that, and you're getting text messages and stuff like that. So if you want to be on that email list or text list, uh, and if you made it here and you want to be more aware of when we're doing zoom calls and just kind of updates in our community, um, feel free to share that info with myself, Ruth or pastor David and we'll make sure you get on that list because we want to keep you informed and up to date and included and cared for and just recognized and loved so yeah do that um we have our church uses something called givelify which is where we um it's a giving app it's like where you can can give online and so if you can download that app in this time of uh, not being present with one another where you can't have an, an offering um, we still have church funds that we need to keep up with, and that's just really important to, to keep things rolling for us. Uh, Got to pay for these uh, 
Zoom meetings. They're, they're not free. So uh, yeah, that's a uh, Givelify. You can find it on our website as well too. You can go to ncwc.net and give there as well. So um, checks are still welcomed if you'd like to mail them to, uh, to David as well too. Uh, yeah, it's, we're just, we just have to be grateful for being here, grateful for technology, grateful for each other and see one another through a screen. And it's not the same as in person, but just the gratitude to be able to see each other's face and uh, yeah, just gratitude, gratitude for one another. So thank you for being here. Thank you for showing up um, in, in craziness, in chaos. Chaos breeds creativity and beauty. So just uh, let us sit in that. And um, yeah, Larisha Hawkins famously said, Jesus taught us to stand in solidarity with the oppressed and persecuted. So to that, we're gonna turn to Jacob um, to read our congregational reading. And Jacob's gonna pop up on the screen. Jacob, take it away. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Jacob. What if, you, Jacob. what if you fought a wind and Jews can sit on the Sabbath, the most thing in time? Cease from travel. Cease from buying and selling. Give up just for now on trying to make the world different than it is. Sing it, pray, touch only those who you commit your life to center down. And when your body has become still, reach, reach out. out with your heart. Know that, know that we are connected in ways that are terrifying and beautiful. You could hold it in right Sorry, good. You could hold it in right more. Know that our lives are in, are in one another's hands. So you did come cruel. Do not reach out your hands. Reach out your heart. Reach out your words. Reach out all. Can someone say it? My screen is messing up. Okay. Reach out all the tendrils Thank of you. compassion that move invisibly where we cannot touch. Promise, Promise this the world, this world your, your, you, love. your love for, for better or for worse in, in sickness and in health so long, so long as we shall all shall live. Well, um, look, we, we were going to uh, have a video that I thought was uh, in line with, uh, with the story of Dr. Larisha Hawkins. However, because of the, uh, the bandwidth issues, I think we're going to skip the video and go straight to her. And let me just say, Dr. Hawkins, Dr. Hawkins. we really appreciate you uh, being available and uh, sharing your story. I've been inspired, my wife and I both have been really inspired by, uh, by you. Uh, I think one thing that stands out most is how you can do something that is good and never expect blowback from it, but then all of a sudden there it is. So take it away, Larisha. I think you're still muted. Uh, yes, yeah, she is. There you go. Um, so I don't know how many of you were able to watch the film. Was it shared with? Okay. Yes. So um, just to, I'll just give a little background. Um, 
and maybe open it up to questions for those of you who have seen the film. Um, December 2015, um, just to contextualize what happened, um, San Bernardino, if you recall, the San Bernardino massacre, um, some people who claim to be Muslim, um, Muslim extremists were, um, you know, shot up a community center. Um, and in the wake of that shooting, there was an uptick in um, violence against Muslims. And it was, if you recall, also the presidential primary season. And candidate Donald Trump said um, around the same time as the shooting, um, the massacre um, in San Bernardino, that he announced that if he were to be president of the United States, that he would enact a Muslim ban. Um, similar, in, around the same time, Jerry Falwell Jr. said in chapel um, at Liberty University, um, speaking to the entire student body because the entire student body is required to attend chapel because it's a Christian school that um, he said he he was mocking President Obama and then he said if Muslims walked in here if everyone was carrying what I have in my back pocket meaning a gun and then he said we could end those Muslims before they end us um, and by the way we offer um, you know, gun training classes on campus, uh, cer gun certification class. And um, I was a professor at the time at Wheaton College outside of Chicago, Illinois, and Wheaton is a historically activist school. Wheaton College was a stop on the Underground Railroad, and it was originally a, um, it was originally founded by an abolitionist and um, his contemporaries were William Lloyd Garrison, um, who most of you have heard of historically. The founder of Oberlin College was a friend of his, which was also founded as um, an abolitionist university. And um, what was transpiring was I was, had just started a peace and conflict studies program at the school. So I was teaching in the first semester of this peace and conflict studies program was thinking a lot about what does it mean to not only teach my students, and I'm a political science professor, um, what it looks like to think about justice in the public realm, that government is supposed to do justice for, toward citizens and in society, um, but to move out of the classroom into the world and teach my students that justice isn't just something that we theorize about up here, but it's something that we do, something that we embody. Um, that to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God means putting feet to our faith, literally. Um, and so thinking about the prophetic books of scripture um, and also thinking about Jesus' model in the Sermon on the Mount became one of the ways that I was trying to infuse um, faith into the things that we were learning in the classroom. So a student um, came to me in the wake of Jerry Falwell Jr.'s statement and said she wanted to wear um, a headscarf home. Um, Muslims call it um, a variety of things, but often the hijab, a head covering. Um, and so she said, as Christian college students, I would love to wear this hijab home in solidarity with Muslim women on the airplane because it was Christmas time. And, um, and she said, plus as college, Kids, we've got networks all over the world and we could call non-Christian college women to wear the hijab on the airplane home. Since again, Muslim women were being stopped by the TSA all of the time, Muslims were being persecuted in unprecedented ways. Um, and I said, well, let me talk to my friends at the Council on American Islamic Relations. I served on a board with um, one of their board members and they gave the blessing. And um, as college students are, she didn't call, she, didn't, she never answered my email. But I had told her that this wasn't just something that I would check on to make sure that this wasn't considered offensive or unclean or defiling of the Muslim notion of hijab, but also that I would do that with them as a form of embodying solidarity with Muslim sisters and brothers. Um, and 
again, modeled on the Sermon on the Mount. So that evening I went home and I typed up a Facebook post and it talked about um, the fact that I love my Muslim neighbor, not because they're American, but because they are formed of the same primordial clay um, and that we worship the same God. Um, so I talked about human solidarity, religious solidarity, um, mentioned that I had received permission from the Council on American Islamic Relations, which is a Muslim organization, um, to do this and invited people into what I was calling a narrative of embodied solidarity with women in the hijab. Um, the post went viral. It was the last day of class um, when I posted this. Finals was the next week. Um, I saw immediate pushback from what I perceived to be mostly Christians, but I also saw a wide embrace of the message from Muslims. Some of my um, atheist colleagues on board, some of my Jewish friends, you know, people who, the people who were pushing back um, most vehemently and loudest were Christian brothers and sisters. And the sticking point seemed to be not that I was embodying solidarity. And also because it was December, I called it for me an act of Advent devotion, that I wanted to, to do it um, as a practice, as a spiritual devotion. Um, we're in the time of Lent and I was thinking about Lent um, and I was thinking about how can I focus my worship during the season mm -hmm. of, of Advent, right? Um, people were focused on shopping and academia were focused on, you know, finishing classes, giving finals, grading finals, so much so that um, I usually go home to Oklahoma where I'm from and I'm still grading um, for days after I get home. So my, um, my real intention was to be embodied with my Muslim sisters, but also to do the incarnation, uh, live incarnationally in the way that Jesus um, came for us. Um, not in a little baby bundle, like we like to minimize the significance, um, but in, in all of his embodied fullness. Um, and that was really like um, what I wanted to do. And a firestorm, I like to say all hell broke loose. And um, within five days, I was put on um, administ what's called administrative leave with my university. Well, it's not called administrative leave. It was made up. Um, no such thing existed. And all of a sudden it did. Um, so then I was in this fight for my job um, as well. Um, so I'm still wearing the hijab, trying to fight for my job, um, and within two months, the college and I um, parted ways. So um, a little background, I was the first black woman to be tenured in the history of the university, which was a stop on the Underground Railroad. Um, so I had tenure as, you know, job security for professors, um, and so I lost my tenure, um, my employment, and um, and again, a, a spiritual community because Wheaton's a Christian school. Um, it's all Christian professors. It's, um, yeah, so that's just a little, that's just to give you background on the story. So the film then documents that um, I am now in Charlottesville, Virginia, where I teach in the politics and religious studies departments. So my research is the intersection of religion, race, and politics. And um, so I work with several um, labs here that study that and also are seeking to bridge the gap between community and, and the university. Um, so I continue to press forward in my academic work, but um, perhaps obviously or not so obviously, um, I'm now labeled an activist, right? Um, and that's something I take seriously but I think that's something that all Christians are called to do. Like I said, um, if standing with and for the most oppressed, which is what I think Jesus calls us to do, means I'm called an activist, then I guess that's another job I had. So I'm an academic. Um, I'm someone who wants to live um, in the way of the Jesus, which I think is a radical way to live. Um, because ultimately embodying solidarity could mean our death. Um, 
and it's living in the way of the prophet, speaking truth to power wherever we are, um, from whatever our perch in society is. Um, and so embodied solidarity for me is a way of being in the world um, and not and not having these separate selves. Like I was always trying to teach my students, you're not just in a mind. You're not here just to exercise this brain muscle like we're embodied people. And I think that's also a message for the church. Um, the idea that the body doesn't matter um, is one of the oldest heresies um, of Christianity, so of the Jesus movement. So that's who I am. And that's what um, the film ultimately explores. So. So any questions or thoughts? Okay, uh, I will, uh, in, and anybody else can weigh in, but my question is, is uh, Larisha, since these things happened in your life, uh, what have you learned about Islamophobia, the roots of Islamophobia in the West or in America? Um, I think Islamophobia is an excuse. Um, when I hear people say they're afraid of Islam or afraid of Muslims, um, there's there's not um, any any particular thing that they're pointing to, right? I think um, so. When I hear people talk about Islamophobia, I think that it gives people an out for for ignorance, um, for the kind of otherization that we see in in other ways. I mean, I hate to keep coming back to the president, but um, the kind of language that says Mexicans are foreign um and that there's an invasion happening at the border um the kind of um language that demonizes any human right and so i think that people have i think that islam is a convenient target um and i think that what i learned about the vitriol that was spewed my way um, regarding my statements about the same God, when people are honest, um, and the filmmaker, um, the woman who approached me about making this documentary, um, Same God, she said, to be honest, I attended Wheaton College. They had to take Old Testament, New Testament, Christian thought. Um, so you're required to take these classes at Wheaton. She said, I had never thought about it. She said, I had never thought about the Abrahamic religions coming out of the the branch of um, the Abrahamic faiths, right? Um, and the fact that they're all pointing to the same God. And so I think that um, when I hear people say that it's Islamophobia, I think it's not Islamophobia as much as politics, right? The politics of our society that looks for a convenient group to blame for um, their lack of whatever they think they're missing out on, right? Um, the fact that churches are declining, the fact that Gen X, or, or excuse me, Gen Y, millennials, and Gen Z are attending church less, it's because of these other outside influences, um, the demographic shifts in the country. So I see it less about fear and more about um, people being lazy in their thinking um, and I blame elites, right? I blame the people in the top, at the top. I, bl I blame religious leaders, political leaders, cultural leaders, because they're the ones putting out these messages that Islam is bad or Muslims are all bad, right? Like it's, it's that, you know, um, hate crimes against Muslims and against Jews, um, as well, but hate crimes against Muslims are at a higher rate than they were during 9-11. Um, and that's the time we're in. Um, I think it's more about politics than it really is about fear. But it is some, it's a tactic, of course, that people use, but. Um. Well, thank you for that. And I see that um, 
that uh, Rubina Abadi uh, raised her hand. Rubina, you there? Yes, I am. Hi, Larissa, thank you so very much for um, this context that you gave. I followed the story. I, I am also an academic, but I don't consider myself just to be an academic, but an activist academic. And so I, <clears throat> I really appreciate what you laid out. And I'm also a political scientist, global studies person. So oh, I, can I can relate to what you had to say. For me, thinking and acting are not separate things in any way, because the way that we think is the way that we act. And I just do want to um, say thank you for laying this out so clearly. It is never about religion. It is how we make it about religion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how we make it about religions, if we're talking from a lens of politics, yeah. is all the things that we learned to do to enable a certain narrative. So thank you very much. I would love to talk to you a lot more, but I don't want to take up all of this time. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm Googling you, so I'll remember to, I'm, I'm using my phone to like find you online so we can connect later, or you can get my info from um, David. I would love to okay. talk more. Larisha, okay. I just want to say that uh, Rubina, she used to live here in Santa Barbara, and she attended our church and went, uh, she taught at Westmont College. And now she's the department head at Cal State Monterey of Global Studies. Oh. Yeah. Lovely. I love it. Y'all, I want to come to Santa Barbara someday. Just well, we were going to do that, trying to try to make that happen. <laughs> after the, after, you know, when, when we um, cease social distancing, um, I've always wanted to visit Santa Barbara. So. I guess I am visiting Santa Barbara, but right now. Hi, my name's Matt, and I have a question about kind of reconciliation and what that process looks like. I know you did the um, Peace and Conflict program, and then after kind of, or, or Wheaton's kind of reaction to this was to have a reconciliation service. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious what your take is on a reconciliation process and kind of the critiques and falling shorts that um, Christianity has kind of taken place in the way of reconciliation. Um, yeah, I, I, I follow like uh, Erna Kim and just kind of she says reconciliation shouldn't be the goal. And so we need to stop with that. And so yeah. it's, I, I'm curious how you've kind of processed that as kind of that directly impacted you um, at a school set, like the, the whole school was there, you know, and so in kind of in the spotlight and then how you, what a, I don't want to say proper, but like, what would, what would a reconciliation process look like? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know who, um, who you refer to as talking about reconciliation that should not be a goal. I think that's, that's a whole sermon, like full stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll just be blunt. When I hear um, Christian churches talk about um, recon racial reconciliation, I'm really suspicious right off the bat. I'm like, um, because often, so we have to consider the standpoint, like who's the one talking about reconciliation? It's often top down. Mm -hmm. Reconciliation often means when I again when I hear evangelicals talk about it, it often means assimilation. It often means um, conforming to whatever the normative viewpoint is. Um, I've seen it in multi-ethnic church contexts look like a plantation mentality, like black and brown folk are allowed to come on your plantation. And then they go back to their hoods. Um, even if your church is in their hood, it's like they're the guests and you're the host, um, which isn't like what reconciliation looks like 
um, in scripture. Um, the Apostle Paul, who is not Jesus, calls reconciliation a ministry. Um, ministry is ongoing. It's not a one point. It's not, it's not, again, it's an ongoing process. It's iterative. It's dirty. It's over and over and over. It's one step forward, three steps back. Because when we're talking about something like confronting the United States, uh, race in the United States, it means um, there's no such thing as post-racial, and we learned that, right? And so um, I'm very weary of people utilizing the term reconciliation, not because it shouldn't be a reality for the Christian. It should be who we are. Like in our bodies, we should be bearing that ministry and doing that all the time, just as part and parcel of who we are, of like what it means to be a Jesus follower. And so, um, so I mean, to call any particular ministry or any particular service a reconciliation service says to me something like, um, we can check this off our list, like, like a predominant, like, like universities that get a vice president for diversity and inclusion. Um, and because they've done that, they've done their work, right? So um, those are the things that I think are really important to think about when you hear those words. I would just always say, be suspicious. I'm always suspicious when I hear that word um, because it oft, again, it often means from someone's standpoint, this is what we're going to do. Um, and we're going to say, we've done something um, or built something. And because we built that, we're done, right? If that makes any sense. It's okay. not programmatic, right? Is what I'm trying to say. It's not, a, it's not a particular program. It's not even a particular stance, it's, it's messy and dirty. It has to be constantly um, tended, which is like most good things. Mm -hmm. uh, so, hard, hard to keep. Larissa, since you, you, you're touching on race, uh, I, I have this theory and I don't know, you know, I mean, it's not, it's unproven, but, and black people can be as dogmatic as anybody else, but it seems like uh, the thrust of Islamophobia in our times um, comes from people. I mean, we as African Americans, we we all know somebody named Khalil or Jamal or you know Khadija or Aisha or something like that. We know people like that, but and so we're not as. I mean, we've eaten the bean pies, if you will. Um, so, uh, do you think that there's a, a fear that comes from not having exposure? Mm. Well. Um... If, I think that if it were only about being proximate, right? Um, if it were only about like, oh, if only we knew X or Y or Z, and then there would be justice for those people, right? Um, we all know um, poor people. We all know women who are discriminated against in their workplaces. We all know LGBTQ folk, right? Um, I don't think proximity to a group that is different than us changes people. Like if it were only about proximity to difference, if it were only about that, right? Um, I think it's, again, I think it's more, I think that that can work, but um, I think that people can be changed by knowing someone. Um, but what we also know about psychology is, you know, I grew up in a predominantly white suburb. Um, so I was the one black person in, you know, the gifted and talented program. Um, so what I know is throughout my life, I was people's black exception to the rule. Um, so much so that people then didn't consider me black. Like, oh, she's not black. She's not really black, you know, like. Um, 
So proximity um, isn't the only thing that does the work of undoing the logics of oppression that people have received. I, again, I think people have to be taught that, right? Um, I remember as a kid, someone telling me a Polish joke. Who tells Polish jokes? In Oklahoma, we barely have Polish people, right? And I remember going home and telling my parents, and my parents were sa said, who told you that joke? And I told them, and they said, that's a racist joke. And I was like, but he's a nice person. They said, he can be a nice person, but guess where he got the joke? His parents, right? So we ha I think we have to unlearn these fears. And I think we can. We can unlearn stereotypes. We can consciously reject things that we think deep down. We know that. But proximity just doesn't, proximity is not always the answer. Um, I wish that it were, um, but it's not. But it, it's not. Um, I'm going to give you an example. In Wheaton, Illinois, um, in, the, in the suburbs, the west suburbs of Chicago, northwest, which is where Wheaton was, 25, 30 miles outside of Chicago, there's a critical mass of, of Muslims. And the majority of them there um, are of Arab descent. And the city, when Muslims began in larger numbers to build mosques, the city passed zoning ordinances to keep the mosques from going up. This is, this is a city with the largest community college in the state of Illinois, Wheaton College, which is called the Harvard of Evangelical Schools, some of the best high schools in the state of Illinois, very well-to-do people. And they enact what I call economic violence and religious violence against a group because it was majority Christian. And these are people who have Muslim neighbors, right? And so, and people who have the like wherewithal. And so I think that some of this is, when I say it's political, I think politics really permeates um, society in ways that are both seen and unseen um, in terms of who's in and who's out. It was, it was a form of form, it was a, it was formal exclusion, right? Trying to keep religious groups out of, um, the Tony suburbs because of um, not Islamophobia, um, but a, but because of of kind of organized this group um, who lived close by and went to school with these people's kids. So I, I just think proximity. I wish it were the answer, um, but I don't. I don't think um, it's all. It always is. I, I do think in some cases it's helpful. Um, but in other cases, it's not as much, so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Brigitte. I have a question. Um, I, I agree, and I've seen everything that you're talking about, but I've always wondered what would, what would be effective for changing that? How do you go about changing that? Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the ways that we go about changing when you say that i guess you mean exclusion generally like well, um, well, racial things, violence economic violence things things that are coming from parents like i don't want to say it's unconscious because it's very conscious but mm -hmm. kids not knowing that it's coming from parents or or you know things getting passed along in a community, it's almost like a wave that's coming along and, and people um, are not fighting against it because they sometimes don't see it for what it is. And, yeah. and I, I, feel like, I feel like this wave is happening in almost everything. It's happening with women, it's happening with LGBT, it's happening with Christians. Mm -hmm. You know, you, there, there's, a, there's, there's this force behind people that kind of pushes things along and I feel like that's the force that needs to be changed but it's almost I don't know where you would start with that 
Mm -hmm. or, or okay. what would be an effective thing to do? Because I, I agree with what you said, proximity doesn't seem to do it. Um, even education doesn't seem to do it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there are a lot of studies that show that um, that education doesn't have the effect that we <laughs> we would hope it has, which can sound like hopeless. I do still think that it comes down to holding our leaders to account, um, which doesn't mean that we don't have responsibility. What I think that it means is that we have responsibility on multiple levels once we see, right? Um, so those of us who see these disconnections, um, we have a responsibility, number one, to speak truth to our neighbor ab about who these people are. I mean, in effect, all I did was say, actually, I, I, I know Muslims. Um, what's funny is my closest Muslim friends were men from graduate school and from a board that I was serving on at the time in Chicago. I didn't really know many Muslim women. Um, I just thought this is unconscionable what can I do? Um, again, this was a bug in my ear from a student who just didn't basically follow through immediately on what we had talked about. And so all of a sudden I'm the center of the, what shouldn't have been a controversy, but of the, the action of solidarity. Um, and it was a small way in my mind of, I thought a hundred people are gonna see it on my Facebook page, right? Um, but it was just a small way of bringing attention to the fact that I see you. Um, and, I, and so I think it's more than, you know, like about being an ally. Um, I think allyship can be really distant. And the reason I talk about embodied solidarity is because there is a way that I'm hopeful that wherever we live and wherever we are, the embodied part means um, justice just means showing up for other people. Um, it doesn't mean that I'm not, not, I'm not a Muslim woman. I can't know what it's like in my body to be Muslim, except that I wear a hijab for a while. So people assumed I was Muslim. Um, and I was subject to the same kinds of violence um, and potential abuse that they were. Um, that was a small thing for me to do, but what it did was it did bring attention to these friends and neighbors um, in my local community and in the world. Um, and so I do think it's a small thing, but also what it did is it spoke to other institutions and venues about the moment that we're in, right? So then the media becomes involved. Then um, beyond that, local authorities become involved. Um, the whole American Association of University Professors became involved. My whole discipline of political science became involved. And so there are ways that our actions of showing up for people do educate, like at the local level, at the state level, local, you know, national level, et cetera. There are ways that our efforts, whether they're kind of activist, whether they're lobbying, whether they're correcting some misinformation on Facebook or on Twitter, right? I think all of these things do matter because you have friends who see your solidarity and ask questions, right? Um, so I think sometimes we discount the small things, the small ways that, that we can be in solidarity with other people are ways of checking that misinformation. Um, and so, yeah, I think, that's what Jesus is calling us to do in the Sermon on the Mount, is to walk a mile in our neighbor's shoes. And it goes a long, long way. Um, it does go a long way, I believe that. And some of us are in a position like um, Rabina to have bigger platforms. The size of our platform is not the point. It's, it's how we use you know, the spaces that we're in um, to stand in solidarity with other people. Hi, Larisha. Um, I'm Kenichi. My wife and I are watching you right now, and we did watch your um, docudrama yesterday. Um, and actually, I've been I've been listening to a lot of your well a TED talk and 
a lot of your lectures on embodied solidarity have been very much inspired. I've even um, um, listened to your, I think it was at Wild Goose Festival, you had a couple of uh, interviews. And, yeah. and so, first of all, I, I, you know, thank you for your courage, for your grace and your love, and, and how you demonstrated the love of Jesus um, as you even, you know, as you embodied what you were teaching and as you are um, causing us to move toward. So I thank you. And I think uh, your voice is, um, is, is very much needed. Um, I've been, for the last year, maybe or so, I've been listening to a lot of women of colors uh, voices, including yours. And mm -hmm. so I am grateful. I am indebted to you and it's, um, have been inspired. And so first I wanted to continue to encourage you to keep speaking Thank and you. don't hold back, keep speaking. And, and, and secondly, um, I wanted to, um, that one more question beyond this. Um, if anyone of us wanted to get in touch with you, actually we, I work for Fuller Seminary here in Pasadena Oh, wow. And we have one, and, and for the Department of Marriage and Family Therapy, although I'm not a therapist, we have a, we have a, a student who's an alum of um, Wheaton, and I just asked him, I said, how can I get in touch with Laricia? And he said, okay, just send me an email and let me see if I could contact uh, a friend of mine, um, and, but I haven't heard back. So lo and behold, when Pastor David said, you're going to be our guest, I'm like, oh my, you know, so if there's a way to get in contact with you, that's not going to be, I'm sure you're in contact with a lot of people. So I want to respect that. But if there's a way that we could, whether by email, I'm not a social media person. Um, mm -hmm. um, so uh, if you could uh, forward that information to Pastor okay. David, maybe he can share with us. And, okay, and the last question right is, I'm sorry. I'm typing the last yeah. Where are you now? The last question I have is, where are you at in your spiritual pilgrimage? Um, you, you know, I, I know that you have, you are continue to evolve. I, I sense that. And, and I'm very curious where you are at in your pilgrimage in all this. Yeah. And, and is the church that you attend currently, the congregation that the documentary kind of ends on, you know, you, you guys are taking communion. Um, so yeah, so I'm curious about where you're at yeah. in your spirituality. Well, thank you so much. Um, and give Fuller my love. The film was at Fuller, um, I think this past fall, or was it a year ago? I don't remember, but I was in a different location um, with the film. So I think it was about a year ago. Um, so the film has been at Fuller. So um, I, um, so in the film, it shows the church that I attended in Chicago. It's called St. Martin's Episcopal Church. And it's a multi-ethnic um, church, but a historically black Episcopal church on the west side of Chicago. And to give you context, the west side of Chicago is one of the, if you look at statistics, it's kind of the, um, the statistics that you don't want to see um, in a city or in a neighborhood or in a community. Um, the neighborhood is called Austin and the basketball player, um, former basketball player of old Isaiah Thomas came out of the Austin neighborhood. But it's one of the highest um, rates of gang membership in the city. Um, it's one of the highest murder rates in the city, the worst education statistics in the city and some of the highest poverty in the city of Chicago. Um, but this old Episcopal church still stands and it has become, um, and it's quite small, but it's become a place where um, they welcome everyone. So a lot of former Wheaton students have um, started attending there and some former Wheaton professors and that's how I started attending the church. And, um, which, and it's kind of strange um, in the sense that it's somewhat progressive for evangelicals, and that's the strange part about all these meeting people flocking there. So 
the pastor always says, I didn't know that as a black gay Episcopal priest, um, Wheaton College would be coming to my church. If you told me that, I would have said you were lying, you know? So, um, but what's beautiful about the church is that um, the love of Jesus is there. And also I grew up in the black church. My grandfather was a pastor and the organist is amazing. Um, so it's like all of these worlds colliding of um, the liturgy of the sacrament of the Eucharist, but also um, the music um, that I call my soul music, the music of the, of the traditional black church. Um, and so I say that to say that the spiritual journey aspect has been very difficult for me. Now that I'm in Virginia, um, just before I was with you guys, I was doing Zoom church, um, as you all are doing Zoom church with my church here, which is also an Episcopal congregation. Um, we also read the poem by Lynn Ungar that you all read today about this being a time of Sabbath. So that also felt like an affirmation um, of my being with you that that, that was um, reified. But I think the most difficult part for me, and thanks for asking about my own spiritual journey, um, is that when you are exiled from a spiritual community, it cannot help but harm your, um, your own spiritual journey. I, I mean, I don't, I've never met anyone who was exiled from a spiritual community that was not struggling on some level. Um, and that's just where I am. Um, I think it's uh, certainly been strengthening um, in some ways. Um, while I was in the middle of the two months where I didn't, where I was still fighting for my job and all of these things, um, I remember I was not sleeping very much. Um, and I remember though one night I had fallen asleep and I woke up in the morning and there was this old like gospel hymn in my head and um it wasn't one that we sang at my episcopal church it was one that um i think we used to sing at the church i grew up in um and so it just occurred to me that like when you're in the dark night of of your soul right um and you wake up with a song in your heart you know you've got something within you that the world, like as an old song says that the world didn't give you and the world can't take away from you. Like I did not conjure up that song in my head. So when in the darkness, um, like that light of Jesus comes out, um, you know that um, the prayers of the people are sustaining you. You know that um, the spirit of the universe is sustaining you. And so um, while this has been a really difficult time spiritually and emotionally, um, it's also been a time where I've felt held up by um, the saints. So, yeah. And we all need that at different times. And so, you know, I like to say that grandmas like mine who pray on their knees every night, my granny's 89 and she's still prays on her knees every night for me and for each one of you. She doesn't know you, but she loves you and she prays for you. And if you come to her house, you will be, you will feel like you are her grandchild and she'll make you a peach cobbler <laughs> if I ask her to. So you better be good because it's a really good peach cobbler. So, um, you know, those are the people. When my granny says, I've been praying for you, I say, granny, I know, I know. Mm -hmm. That's how I'm getting through. So um, it's the prayers of the people. So. Well, um, we, uh, it's, 10 o'clock, um, we are very grateful to um, have you and I wanna see if there's one more question before we stop. Hi, buddy. I see you in your tie-dye shirt. I have one. Go. So I really appreciate you, uh, Professor Hawkins or whatever you prefer to be called. Um, I, my question is this. So Jesus has these harsh words, you know, you are of your father, the devil. And the implication of the, the conversation there is not everybody who thinks they're worshiping the same God does. Um, but I'm guessing that 
there's a point at which a person has to realize that those who worship a kind of a harsh, uh, merciless, exclusive uh, uh, we, God who has his favorites and then uh, really essentially hates everyone else, uh, they're not worshiping the same God as the God that John is talking about when he says, the person who loves is born of God and knows God. I felt uh, kind of booted out of evangelicalism um, for starting to make the connection that people who are who are seeking for to become merciful like the God they believe in, you know, uh, that they're they're on the same page with me even if they have different beliefs of various sorts more than people who you know subscribe to the religion i'm familiar with and who when it really gets down to it uh believe in a kind of a um okay tyrant. sorry no i can hear you my phone my i don't know what happened but my the pinwheel was just spinning and spinning so i have no idea what you just said <laughs> I was like wow. looking through my phone to see if I could just call you on my phone, but like, okay, so sorry, I don't know what you said. So maybe now you let can summarize see. it. Everyone, and then... everyone else heard it, so I'll, let me just summarize. John says, "The person who it loves is born of God and knows God." And in the same place, he also says, "God is love." So, you know, do you ever get the feeling that? you're being sort of shown the door of evangelicalism because you subscribe to that principle more strongly than the principle that all our beliefs are correct? Hmm. Um, that's a great question. Um, I guess that's a stalling tactic when people say that. <laughs> that's a good question. Um, but it is a good question. And I love how you prefaced it with First John. Um, and I guess I'm stalling because I like to be, um, my goal is not to be um, unnecessarily harsh and critical of evangelicals, like people who, I think we're all called to be evangelical if we're Christians. All it means is sharing the good news. Um, so evangelicalism I view as a socio-political movement that has lots of litmus tests um, about right belief about um, and some of those beliefs have nothing to do with the good news at all um, mm -hmm. so right belief about politics right belief about how institutions should look right belief about what kinds of songs you sh could should sing or and there are plenty of people who have those ideas. It's not just evangelicalism, right? Um, and so I think that what I just don't think that we can embody solidarity and love in the way that Jesus did unless we see people as radically equal. Um, so, so back to first John. Um, if we do not love all people created in God's image and the earth that God created, um, believe that it's core and central to our well-being, then I, I, I'm not sure we can. Oh, you're muted. You're, you're muted, Larisha. You're mute. You back? We might have lost her for the moment. He's still here, it shows. Uh, oh. Well, look, while, while we don't have her, uh, it's about time for us to close. And I want to remind everybody to, uh, to uh, those, especially the regulars, to, to give. Uh, I, have some, I have a lineup of guest speakers through the rest of the year, because I don't know when the social distance, even even if we're having to be in our homes, uh, I still think Zoom is going to be an option for us. But, um, but 
Oh, there you are. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I don't know what's happening, but um, it's just going, it was going crazy. And I hadn't touched anything. So anyway, um, so I, I do, I just think fundamentally, like, love God, love self, love neighbor. That's God's law. And I, I believe we have to do that however it looks um, and continue to look like Jesus and speak like the prophets as we do it. And so, yeah, that's probably why I was exiled. And I like to say I would do it again and again and again in a heartbeat. And if the price is being exiled from a community, so be it. So be it. Hey, hey everybody, keep... Uh... Keep Dr. Hawkins in your prayers, and we'll pray right now. Thank you, giver of every good gift, provider of life, and all of the things that make life. Thank you for an awareness of who we are, our connectivity to one another, not just through, through this medium, but our, our connectivity with the clouds and with the breezes and with, um, with, with the animals, everything. We, we recognize that we are a part of something way big. It precedes us and we are in awe of being in your creation and we receive your love and we ask this love to, to be infused afresh in Larisha's life, that she will experience uh, your presence, your grace, your anointing uh, in, in multiple do doses at unsuspected moments. Amen. 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 Thank you all. It was so good to be with you. And again, someday, hopefully I'll get to visit you guys in Santa Barbara. So yes. I hope so. Thank and you. Dr. Dave. Do you my number or my um, emails on the chat. I hope you guys saw. Awesome. Yes, I saw it. Thank yeah. you. Dr. Thank Dave, you. Dr. Dave, do you have a word for us before we stop uh, for local health update? Well, the local update as of 5 p.m. last night is that there were, there are, uh, or there were as of 5 p.m. last night, 64 cases of COVID-19 in Santa Barbara County. Um, yesterday, nationwide, there were over 2,000 deaths. And what's disturbing about that is that we hit 1,000 two days before on Thursday, which means that we're in an exponential phase right now. So uh unfortunately our best protection remains the social distancing which has uh been the cause of this this uh um meeting instead of us meeting in, in person may i just add uh, uh one or two other little things uh i was um making a plea that we call this illness what it is last week uh covid-19 caused by this no a novel coronavirus, which uh, popped up in Wuhan, China uh, uh, last December. Uh, later last Sunday, I was driving around, had the radio on, and I uh, the uh, daily briefing, White House briefing on coronavirus uh, and COVID-19 came on, and I heard the president again call it the Chinese uh, virus, which really made my blood boil. Uh, I seem to have no video, uh, but I'm holding my hand the Tuesday New York Times and there's a front page story entitled Spit On, Yelled At, Attack, Chinese Americans Fear for Safety, Growing Racism Jars Nations, it Jars Asians Nationwide. So that's what I was uh, trying to, uh, if you will, preach against. Uh, so uh, the... Uh, and sadly, the president and the and the and in the New York Times and in goings ons have made my the point for me. So I know that's uh, that we don't we don't make those errors, um, and we should we should speak out against them. Uh, the other comment I was going to make uh, is that uh, the USA is number one. All right. We've surpassed China as having the most cases. Uh, and there's, there's a reason for it. It's because uh, we've had uh, 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 poor leadership on it. 
in, in a really disgraceful way. Uh, and I'm reading from the current uh, New Yorker. Everybody, well, many of you know I'm from the Northeast, so I still read the New York Times and the New Yorker. And the current issue of the New Yorker has a piece in the, uh, in the front section called Talk of the Town. And it's quite an extraordinary um, a story. It reads, last week as cities across the country shut down in an effort to slow the spread of COVID-19, President Trump said, we have a problem that a month ago nobody thought about. <laughs> well, somebody did. On December 29th, as Trump- Unfortunately not him. <laughs> on December 29th, as Trump vacationed with his family at Mar-a-Lago, Avi Schiffman, a 17-year-old from Washington State, launched a homemade website to track the movement of the coronavirus. Since then, the site ncov2019.live, ncov2019.live, has had more than 100 million visitors. Uh, so this notion that nobody thought that something like this could happen is, of course, nonsense. There are people who have careers dedicated uh, to addressing this sort of thing. It happened uh, about 100 years ago in, two in uh, uh, 1918. More people died from the what was called the Spanish flu, but which actually originated in Kansas. Uh, more people died from that uh, pandemic than died in the First World War. It's not clear why, but epidemiologists have worried about it happening again ever since. Mm -hmm. So. The, there are books written about this. There's a great one called uh, the, the Great uh, Flu. Uh, it's a wonderful um, uh, uh, book that tells the story about that. Uh, and we don't know why that happened. So therefore, we've been, we felt vulnerable about, uh, about it happening again. And uh, the Trump administration apparently uh, well, not apparently, did tear up a, a pandemic preparedness plan. So the idea that nobody had ever thought about this kind of thing happening uh, is ridiculous. We, uh, this, this is a self-inflicted uh, wound. And uh, if, if I sound outraged, it's because I am. Yeah, well, thank you for that. Thank you for being outraged and spreading your outrage um, because we need to be wide awake. With love. Thank you, love. David. Diane says with love. Um, so that's all, everybody. Thank you for being here. I love you. And bye now. We love you. Bye. Thank you. Have a great day, Have a great day everybody. Love y'all. Love you, too. Hello, my sissy. Hello. <laughs> Cynthia. 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 <laughs> Good to see y'all. Good to see you. Good to see you. All right. Well, well, I'll see you Thursday. Uh, if not Thursday, I'll see you Sunday. All right. Bye, All right. Cynthia. Bye. Hey. Hey, Matt. How are you? <laughs>